Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture 11 of AI605. Okay, so let's get started with today's lecture. So as well, always we'll begin with announcements and we'll go through a, a bit of recap that we discussed in the last lecture. And today we'll be discussing language model and also syntactic parsing. For the syntactic parsing part, I'll be using the slides from slides by Mohit Benzel at UNC. So announcements. I don't have many today. Number one is that there was a typo that was pointed out on GitHub discussions regarding the the the, the equation for variance when a scalar value is multiplied. And I wanted to mention again that originally I wrote if I have random variable x and scale value a constant a, then this I wrote this, but this is wrong. So it should be a square x. So please keep that in mind. As of now, the the collab notebook has already been edited according to this correction. And number two. So I think starting from the assignment two and also working on the final project, it will be it could be a bit difficult to just work on the collab. Although I think in many cases collab could be better than using other things because it's very convenient. So if you want to get some resources and if you think you cannot you don't have any on your own then i think there are largely two options one is there is a gpu cluster in the graduate school of ai we have about i, ha I believe um 300 to 400 gpus at least like in a few weeks if not now so please make use of it if you like to. I'm not sure if it's possible for non GSAI students for accessing this, but I think please talk with TAs and talk, TAs will help you for this. So if you, especially if you are not in the graduate school of AI. And number two is that we might be able to use AWS credits Although I, I'll have to double check. So if you would like to utilize the AWS credits, then please let me know and I'll double check whether uh, we can utilize. We have received some grants from AWS regarding uh, that can be used for teaching. So we might be able to use it. Any question? Okay. So a bit of recap. So we discussed in last lecture about, uh, we discussed batch normalization in last lecture. So I hope you guys remember that batch norm is a very popular regularization trick in image classification and anything that involves really deep, a lot of layers, basically deep neural nets. So for instance, before 2016, uh, we were not able to really have a super deep neural net such as like 100 layers or plus, but then with batch norm and residual connections, residual blocks, we were able to increase the number of layers that we can manage without encountering problems like gradient explosion or issues like the model doesn't really get trained. So. Batch norm was really an important discovery in the domain of uh, image and also making neural nets really deep. But for some reasons that are not super, not clear even 
until now, batch norm, although there are some, of course, conjecture why batch norm doesn't work well on the language problems, but the point is that batch norm was not super effective for language problems. And it turns out that layer norm was pretty good at this. And that exactly was the um, normalization technique used in transformer. And it's very crucial for transformer to work. And essentially, essentially normalization, what they do is they try to re make basically, literally they try to normalize the distribution of certain layers inputs so that it doesn't have too, too high variance or if it has, it, it, so that it doesn't have shifted mean because we want the mean to be zero or around zero in many cases. But it doesn't just end there. These normalization techniques, as you see the equation, they also have these scales and biases or shifting. So here the scale will be G, this is scale. And B will be more of a shift. And in best norm, we saw that also such scale and shift exist as well. So here, scale is here, scale. This is scale and this is shift. So they don't just end at the normalization, but they have uh, additional parameters to train. And another difference that I mentioned is that in layer norm, these scale and shift are vectors, not scale values, so that they can have different impacts on each dimension of the layer. We also went over BPE, byte pair encoding. So the real, the real importance here is that for many years, people were trying to create tokenizer with regular expression or some human engineered rules. But it turns out that the one of the most effective tokenization method is data driven in that they try to basically iteratively replace most occurring pairs of bytes or pairs of, I would say, characters with uh, some new vocab word. And this new vocab word will be added to the vocab so that we can have a, at each time step, we will have one more word in the vocab. We can do the iteration until we want to stop. In many cases, we stop at the point when we reach the number of words in the vocab is equal to some number, for instance, 30,000. So this has been the standard for very recent few years, especially in pre-trained language models, people use BP or some variants of BP, such as we mentioned um, word piece. This was using BERT and Lectra. Of course, you might not know what these are, so that's okay. What we're trying to say is that it's the tokenization method that has been used in recent very important works. And sentence piece, which was used in T5, and a similar technique was used also in DGP3. But essentially, the only difference between these two is that word piece assumes that at least space has some role, special role of separating between tokens. In sentence piece, they assume that space is also not a special character, but just a regular character that you want to pair with. Okay. All right, so hopefully that's clear. So if we do this, then one of the really interesting characteristics is if we start from the, for instance, all the Unicodes or all the ASCII code, ASCII characters, then we're iteratively adding one more word to the vocab, but there will be no scenario that any word will be 
unk because you start with all possible characters in, in the beginning. Of course, in some cases, you, you do not start with all possible characters for several reasons. If the character is super rare, then it will be in, 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 inefficient to really add that. So I'm not saying that modern tokenization methods don't have unk at all. They actually do have unk, but it's very rare. You will probably see this in BERT too, when we get to that, there is unk, but it's very rare. So that's the, the really the benefit of using BPE that um, compared to also other rule-based tokenization methods, these bokeh-based are very, rule-based tokenization methods are very, uh, it's not super, it's not rare to encounter unk compared to BPE. So that's one of the advantages of BP. And we talked about teacher forcing. And the main point was that there is, teacher forcing induces a bias called exposure bias. And this is an important concept because you need to be aware that teacher forcing is not exactly being optimized for what you are training for. So that's really the actually definition of bias. So bias is that given your loss function, if your loss function is optimized, um, will you be reaching the your real your your real objective, which is your evaluation metric? And the 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 thing is that it's not the case. So in many cases, when there is no bias in the loss function, so if you have a really strict MLE is uh, which is maximum likelihood estimation, in that case, then you will not have any bias between your loss function and your objective. But teacher forcing has a loss function that has some bias with respect to, res respect to you, what you're trying to achieve, which is your more of a mm, evaluation objective. So it's important to note this. And the reason why is that, of course, we need to be aware that teacher forcing has some bias, or I would say there exists some bias, but this allows us to reduce variance a lot, especially compared to using methods such as policy gradient, which allows you to move away from bias, but has such high variance that the model really not trains at all. If you use it for especially um, sick to sick models. So maybe people sometimes use that for, um, kind of fine tuning at the end. There are some, some actually work that try to do that, but it's rarely observed that policy gradient can be used since the beginning of the early stage of training. So hope that's clear. We talked about exhaustive search, greedy search and BIM search. And I think these were relatively easy, right? Exotic search is just when you're doing the decoding of the, um, in the sick to sick, then you just look at every possible cases, which is of course too many, exponentially too many. So the other extreme of search is greedy search that you choose the best one at each time step of the decoding. But this also has some problems because you might be uh, missing some good solution that was not chosen in the beginning because it had low probability at the time step. So beam search is more often used. Basically you keep top K most probable sequences for each time step of decoding. And of course at each time step, because you will add one more word that will update the, the list of the, the most probable sequences so you will probably reshuffle and also add some and also remove some and you repeat this until you get to the end of sequence generation. So here, um, the K, the top K you're keeping is called beam size. K is beam size. So there are the same thing basically in case you encounter these words when you're reading papers.
Okay. So we'll be going into language model today. So that will be at least like a one third of the today's class. And the other two thirds will be on the syntactic parsing for which I'll be using Mohit's slides, which is I think very great. So now we are ready to talk about language model. So what is language model? I think many of you, even if it's your first time doing NLP here, have heard of language model and things like large language model, pretend language model, um, all these words. And you might be wondering, okay, what is language model? What is the really exact definition of language model? And in fact, it's a bit confusing because when you say like, for instance, vision model or some something model, then you're talking about a model that does whatever is, whatever is in front of that word model, right? So vision model is probably a model that can do some vision task. So sometimes people actually confuse that language model is any model that can do linguistic or language related task, and actually it's not. So convention is that language model is specifically referring to a probabilistic model that can generate text. So what I'm saying is a question answering model is not language model by itself. Also, a uh, machine translation model is not a language model or a type of language model. They're just different tasks. Language model is just trying to define some probabilistic distribution over strings of text. So what does that mean? So in the um, ex most extreme case, you can think of this as um, very, very um, rough or very, um, oh, how I say? So you might, so there are very rare cases that you might be wondering what this is, but still you might want to compute this, right? Like for instance, what is the probability of a certain text? And what does this mean? It's very, very um, abstract notion of, um, I think probability. I mean, it's really abstract to define the, what it means to define the probability of a word. Conditional what? And in fact, um, basically what I mean by probably a word is really um, what would be the probability that given nothing, um, you will observe hello as, as next word. So do you get that? Like it's, it's very abstract. I mean, I think that's uh, something that people usually find because Okay, even if you get the probability, what would be the use case of it? And also, um, wouldn't it be really small? Because it's very unlikely that when you um, saw some text, that your first word will be hello, right? But language model is exact, exactly that. What is the probability of hello given nothing? Or of course, if you know what this is, then it's easy to define what will be the probability of hello world, given your, your first word is hello. So what is, what is the probability that the next word is world? You can think of, you can think of it as this definition. Um, so it, it's usually more meaningful if you think of it as conditional probability, although language model by definition really means that uh, we're trying to define the distribution over the entire possible combinations or possible space of the text. So that's why what I mean by this is rarely useful, right? But um, people what usually use this for is more of a, what is the most likely next word? And it's much more useful because um, I can give you just very, very straightforward applications. Like for instance, when you're writing emails and I think if you're using Gmail, in English, then you might, you might sometimes see that when you wrote a few words, then the Gmail is able to autocomplete your rest of the sentence. And that's exactly based on some language model inside Gmail. Of course, probably trained on these emails instead of um, various kinds of text corpus so that it can be optimized for your email writing. So yeah, application number one, 
auto completion. So this is not only observed in email, but it's more, I think, common when you're writing something on search or maybe with your um, iPhone, uh, your phone on some, when you're just typing text, right? Then, then sometimes they have some suggestion that you can just click so that you can autocomplete. So autocompletion definitely is one um, big application of language model. And more recently, I think many of you have seen news writing. For instance, maybe if you wrote just a few first sentences of some news article, then maybe the machine will be able to complete the rest of that. Although probably it will be um, not accurate or it's impossible to be really, you know, recover the original news, right? Because it's, it doesn't know what fact it will be talking about. So language model by itself actually is, um, I think it's, it's very, it doesn't really make sense that we can expect the language model to be exactly right, right? Because it doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, you cannot know what a person will be saying for sure but you can still define the probability or you can at least compare between candidates, which candidate seems to be more probable that the person will say the next. So you, you should approach language model in this direction because otherwise, if you think of this as uh, things like machine translation or question answering, where there, are, where there are certainly correct answers, then you are not gonna get correct answers in most cases, you will get probable sentences or probable answers, but not correct answers. That's why um, how we evaluate language models um, accuracy is a bit different from QA or machine translation. So in QA, we were using accuracy. Sentiment classification also, we were using accuracy. In machine translation, we use blue score or um, rouge score, which are kind of similar to, I would say, um, how much the reference sentence and your uh, predicted sentence overlap. Although we didn't really go into much details how this is computed. But in language model, that would not be really easy because really it's, I told you, um, there is no way that you can know what a person is gonna say for sure. So instead, how we evaluate this is more of a, what is the likelihood of the, the, this good sentence from the model's perspective? And if that's a bit difficult for you to understand, you can think of it this way, an um, um, easier way. Um, given W1 to like WM minus one, what will be the likelihood of the next word being WN by the model? And that probability, the higher the better, right? Because that that we we actually have seen this WN in our train uh, in our training example, or I mean in um, our I'll say validation examples. So it makes sense that if WN has higher probability, then it's good. But if it has really low probability, then it means the model is guessing that the word WN will not appear, whereas actually has appeared in the data set. So um, we really want to obtain the probability of WN given W1 to WN minus one. This is like a single word case, but when you can basically do this iteratively, right? So what you can do is if you want to compute um, the entire sentence probability, you first compute W1 given nothing. I just will use actually different notation for nothing. So you're given nothing and you're trying to predict what's the next, what's the probability of next word being W1. And then you can try to compute what's the probability of uh, the next word being W2. So I'm not ma being mathematically very um, rigorous here, um, but I think hopefully, hopefully you get the point and you're given W1, right? And you are computing W3 given W1 and two and so on. And I hope 
you recall that if you actually try to simplify this multiplication, this becomes just simply W1 to Wn. And each of these conditional probability is just exactly what's your probability of the next word given the words until the time, current time step minus one, right? So basically you can think of this, this as just a multiplication of what's the probability of next word given all the previous words. And we just want to measure that and that will be the models um, I would say accuracy or how good the language model is given on this data set. So hopefully everyone agrees with that. But why do we um, have this term negative one over n um, on, as the power of this probability? And that's because exactly just a really simple reason actually is because these numbers are super, super small. That's why, it, that's the only reason actually. So. Because if you try to compute this, um, suppose that you have a vocab size of 30,000, then what would be um, a random probability? If you just example a word from by random from the, this vocab, what would be the probability of W1 being the first word given nothing? It will be one over something like 30,000, right? And of course, in fact, of course, the probability of this word being the first word will be probably at least um, higher than this value because not every word in English can be first word, but it will be still very small. Maybe um, not one over 30,000, but something like, for instance, one over 1,000. And that's already very small, but you're multiplying this number several times. And if the sentence is super long, like for instance, if you have one document that has like 500 words, then you are actually powering this by like how much, like 500. And that will be even smaller, right? So you're, you're dealing with really small number and it, it's really impossible to really actually play with this number unless you use the really powerful term logarithm. And that logarithm is exactly um, what's happening here, right? So you're basically um, exponentiating by one over N so that you actually are able to bring this number to um, relatively, I would say manageable number, but um, it's also important to note that it's not just minus N, but it's minus one over N. So, what I mean, what I mean by is, it's not just one over n, but minus one over n. What I'm saying is, because, um, so this is easier to understand that why you're putting minus is that we want to operate in, um, in more of a I would say, uh, greater than zero range than smaller than one. I mean, okay, um, I'll just give an example. So for instance, let's say that our uh, we have just one word. And that probability is one over 1000. So what happens if you actually, um, so suppose that we have n is one, right? Suppose, then uh, we're just computing P of W one over negative one over n. And this is just, what's the probability of the first word given nothing, right? So suppose that was one over 1000. So this will be one over 1000 and we're doing one over n, which is one over one because n is one. So that means we are just computing one over 1000 power of negative one, which is just 1000. So the, the fact that a perplexity of a single word being 1000 really means that, especially compared to, I would say, vocab size, okay, if this model was really bad, that it's just 
predicts every word is equally likely, then its perplexity will be how much? Can you guess that? That will be vocab size, right? Which is 30,000, suppose. In my writing is bad. A random model, right? So that means then our this our model that we're proposing, which has perplexity of 1,000, is much better than the random language model because its perplexity is 1,000 instead of 30,000. So that was the one word case, but you could easily general, generalize what it means if there are several words. Of course, we are we have we'll, we'll have higher end, so that means that we'll be doing geometric more of a geometric averaging over these one, two, three um, next word probabilities. Um, so hopefully that's clear why we're using this term perplexity. So anyone has a question about this? So state of the art language models will have perplexity something like um, 30, 20 on some standard benchmarks. And what does that mean? Especially given the vocab size 30,000, then it means that if you have a random model, then it will be one in 30,000, your probability on correct words. But then if you have like say for, for instance, perplexity of 20, that means then on average, you are uh, your uh, the probability of the the two word um, the models from the models perspective the probability from the models perspective that the, the true word will appear is uh, twenty two uh, percent right because no five percent I'm saying if the PP is a uh, is tw uh, twenty that mean this means the the probability per word will be on average 120, which is 5%. So um, so I think it's easier to think of this way. So of course, it's better if the perplexity of certain model is lower. So what will be the then lower bound of perplexity? Can it go below one? Apparently not, right? Because if it's one, then it's already 100%, but how can you go above 100%? That's impossible. So. The lower bound of perplexity is not zero, but it's one. And of course, it's impossible to achieve that because even human being or anyone can really accurately predict what the a person will be saying next. So hopefully, so there is a there is definitely probably some strict upper bound or lower bound of perplexity of certain model. You cannot you can never reach one. So then what then interesting question is then what will be the lowest possible perplexity of a certain model? And we don't know the answer, but uh, I can tell you that the models these days is getting really low, like 30, 20, et cetera. So how do we construct a language model for this task? So I'll first talk about more traditional methods. And the n-gram language model is really traditional, very, um, I would say, have a really long history. We can t basically spend a few classes on this if you want to cover this in details, but this class is really about deep learning methods, not um, every NLP methods. So I will not cover these. It will be just more of a brief in introduction to it. And you might wonder, so is Ngram language model used at all these days, given that deep learning is take, taking over everything? And my answer is actually yes, because deep learning, deep learning based language model still is very slow on many cases, especially when you're typing something and you want the uh, really fast auto completion, then deep learning based will be very too slow to work on the, especially um, mobile, mobile devices. So. I would like to note that ngram language model or uh, variants are still being used, but um, we will not be discussing this much in the class, especially also because the techniques are more of a very um, empirical and engineering driven than some hypothesis driven. 
in many cases, the really modern ones. Although I'm not saying that that's not a good thing, I'm saying um, just that it's not something that's good to cover in the, um, you know, especially intro to NLP class for deep learning, with deep learning. So probably the easiest way to create a language model is just um, actually one more thing, right? Just a random language model, right? We talked about this. So what was the language, random language model's perplexity? It's just simply um, will be just a PP of uh, this will be vocab size, super large. So we want to be better than this. Would, wouldn't make sense if our model is worse than this, right? Then um, a bit better model will be, can you actually um, have a um, independence assumption between each word. So what that means is then in um, Unigram language model, you are just, you're assuming that for instance, P, P of X2 given X1 is just equivalent to P of X2. You're assuming this in Unigram. Then the good thing is then in that case, that means P of uh, the entire sequence will be just, um, will be a really simple product of all the words, right? And how do you compute each word probability? It's very simple. Um, it's very simple statistics. You just count in your training data, how many times each word appears among all the tokens in training data. So this will be something like, okay, um, this word appeared like a uh, hundred times in this 20,000 word document that I am using for training data. In that case, then it will be one over 200. So that's how you compute, how you can create a very simple Unigram LM. That's of course too naive in many cases because it's not considering any dependency between two consecutive words. So in Biogram LM, you're just considering two consecutive words. So here, what you're trying to compute is, uh, you're assuming is that the probability of x3 given x1 and x2 is can be approximated by probability of x3 given x2. So you, don't, you, you entirely ignore what x1 is. So that's a bit better assumption than Unigram case. So then how can we really create this model? And it's also quite straightforward. You will be counting how many times x2 and x3 appear together. Um, out of how many times X2 appear. So, which makes sense because given the all cases of X2 appearing, what's the count of X3 appearing after X2? So that's how you would um, compute, create the biogram LM. And of course, then in that case, you're just counting the number of unigrams of X2. So that means this is just um, count of x2 over count of the biogram x2, x3. And this was the biogram case. So hopefully you can easily generalize to n-gram language model. But now you get the problem here, right? Because if you actually increase n really a lot, then you're basically trying to count very rare n-grams. Like for instance, in some trigram might never appear in um, training data that you, you encounter during test time. So that's the problem that um, actually angular language model is suffering from a lot. The fact that unigram biogram probably is doable, but above trigram, you'll be observing a lot of trigrams in inference that has been never observed in the um, training time. Even trigram is like that. So can you imagine what would be it? Well, with a case like if n is larger, like 10, then it's almost impossible to really create any model because every 
10 gram that you observe during test time will be not in the training data. So there are several smoothing techniques used to really avoid these unseen engrams during inference time. And also people try with um, actually adding different language models like biogram, unigram, and trigram language models with different weights that where the weights actually sum to one. And actually the reason why you make this summation to one has a probabilistic reason that because you're summing three probability distributions with weights that sum to one, then the resulting probability distribution will be also valid one that they sum to one as well. So these are the details that people have used in any language model, but if you are willing to take a deeper look into these, especially because you're interested in the um, efficient or edge device, super fast language model, then um, I think I'll probably put a link on this schedule. And there are some slides from other classes that have deeper discussion about ngram, but ngram language model. But in our class, um, this will be it. We'll not put much time, more time on this topic. Um, so it's quite apparent that actually modern language models are, especially if you're, your most concern is accuracy, then it's all deep learning driven. We call this neural language models. And actually it's easier to explain how this works in, in these days, especially is because all the language models that you'll be encountering in recent years will be basically sick to sick without encoder, which makes sense. You can basically think of language model as you have a, some sick to sick model, but your encoder has nothing. So from sick to sick point of view, then that just means then um, because in sick to sick, original sick to sick, you have the encoder part and you pass this vector to decoder and you basically decode something. And so in the machine translation sig to sig, this vector was very important, right? This S, but if you want to make this into language model, then a really simple thing is then just fix this S into some fixed vector. It could be just zero vector, for instance, something like, you know, zero, 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 or maybe you might want to learn it too, but um, it's very easy to trans, uh, transform a sig to sig model into language model. And because as I've said, the sig to sig nowadays is dominantly based on transformer architecture. So modern neural language models, when I say modern, it's really recent, like two or three years. It's kind of you know sad that when you say modern in computer science, especially um, AI, I don't mean like, you know, 200, 100 years, but it's actually two to three years. So very recent language models are mostly based on transformers and decoder. So same thing, right? Um, transformer was this some um, attention layers here. And then now this was encoder side and the, in the decoder side, this basically gets inside this decoder layer. So what uh, the dependency of decoder on the encoder will be this encoded, you know, vectors being used for the attention. But of course you can just think of this as a zero vector. Then you can just have decoder being trained on your target language or corpus for the language model. So it's good that actually, once you understood what sig to sig is, then it's easy, easy, much easier to actually explain what language model works, how language model works. Okay. All right. Yep. So um, I wanted to bring this roadmap again at this point because uh, we have covered um, not all, of course, but most, I think, um, I would say most of the tasks and formulations and models on, gosh. sorry about the um, phone call. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's on with the vanilla learning. So, um, 
just uh, another other topics that we're going to be covering before we move on to um, the, uh, the next paradigm of learning, which is uh, pre-training and fine-tuning, will be um, really about other other things, which are really important topics in NLP too. But um, I didn't discuss. I will not put much time on them because um, I I think it's easier to think of them as. Um, more of a, um, you can, you, if you know these formulations, then you can actually oppose those problems without much difficulty. So, but there are several different tasks. For instance, there's things like, um, um, for instance, semantic parsing. Which is really about mapping a language to some logical form that can be understood by machines like SQL query. And there are also, of course, other things like um, multimodal learning, which is dealing with images and text. But basically these tasks, most of them can be approached with one of the formulations that we discussed. Retrieval could be thought a bit differently. So, um, we'll be putting some time on it because retrieval really deals with um, scale, uh, large scale. It has to be really um, concerned with how it can handle large scale, but still in some sense, it's quite uh, relevant to how you formulate text classification because you're using the vector that has been used for the text classification um, for the nearest neighbor search. So retrieval is a bit different case, but still I think can be formulated with um, these three types of formulations. So we will be going through this a bit in today's class and also next class and maybe also next next class, which means we might be using next entire next week as well for some different task. But after that, we'll be basically done with Every, uh, everything that we're going to be talking about with this um, first paradigm of learning, vanilla learning. And this will basically be um, everything up to, I would say, 2017 and maybe early 2018. Um, so I'll say just um, early 2018. And then we'll be moving into the, the newer paradigm of um, learning, which is pre-training and fine-tuning, which really took off, I think, in late 2018. Although I think we kind of knew about this since um, late 2017 and early 2018. And in-context learning is much newer thing that um, I think would be good to briefly go through it, although it's really new that it's really hard for us to be um, studying it at the moment. It's more of a um, observing or taking a look. So a lot of uh, the rest of the class will be about pre-training and fine tuning. And the rest, maybe one or two classes will be about in-context learning. Okay. So I think we'll take a, a three minute break at this point and I'll be using slides from um, the Mohit Bansal from UNC, which I think is very good slides that describes what syntactic parsing is. Um, so I'll see you soon in three minutes.
Welcome back. So I realized that there were two questions. So first question was about what about Bert? So which part of the slides you're talking you're referring to? I mean here. So Bert will be uh, in the pre-training and fine-tuning. So Bert was um, announced released in late 2018. So that's why I actually mentioned that the paradigm shifted in late 2018. Although we knew about this pre-training method since um, late 2017 when the ELMO was proposed. Although the um, how we used ELMO is a bit different from BERT. Oh, okay. So that was your question. Yeah, so BERT is based on transform encoder. Yeah. So. It, so, okay, the reason why BERT is based on transform encoder is because BERT was trained on mask language model. So we'll be covering this later. So um, we, we'll probably have enough time to actually talk about BERT. Actually, the, probably we have, we'll have a lot of time. Um, we'll be talking a lot about BERT. So um, please stay tuned, but just one sentence answer at this point is that BERT, yes, used a uh, transform encoder instead of decoder. So BERT is not really a language model, but for, for several reasons, people just call it, call it mask language model. Mask language model is not really a language model though. Strictly speaking. So another question was, is there something like sentence level language model? Well, that's really difficult to define because you mean then each sentence can be a vocab word, which will be entirely unique, right? So um, if you could clarify what you mean by sentence level language model, then maybe um, I can elaborate more. So let me know if you like. And next question is, oh, can we summarize LMS inferring joint probability distribution over text with some conditional probability? You mean, can we interpret? Can we think of LMS, right? Um, inferring joint probability distribution over text. Yeah, you can think of it like that, but it's kind of, I think, a bit weird to say this is. Um, can you think? Can you say it's joint probability because because like uh, in in text. Um, they are not independent, right? So, but I think, so I'm not sure it would be accurate to say it's, it's a joint probability, but I think I get what you mean. So that you can think of it as a basically probability distribution of the text itself. And there is some conditional probability. No, so language model itself actually is not, um, conditional, but then, um, so language model is just basically a probabilistic model of the text itself. But then we don't use the raw form of language model. We, we rarely use it because you don't, you don't, no one is really interested in what's the probability of such certain sentence, right? It's more of a, people are interested in what word, uh, what should we, uh, what is the uh, best sentence to generate? So this is an important point actually in generative model because generative model, the definition of generative model, um, strictly speaking, is being able to give a probability for every possible um, instance in the, um, I would say output space. So that's the, that's a generative model. But then what I'm trying to say is that people are not too, too much interest in the exact number, exact probability of a certain thing, but more of a, what will be the most probable sentence? And if we are able to get that, then it's, we can easily uh, use that for conditional probability. So it's better to think of that way than language model is um, conditional. So I'm not sure I was clear enough, but um, let me know if you want to be, if you want to talk more about this. Okay, so, all right. 
And of course, I mean, I told you a few times about this. So please feel free to speak up if you'd like to really interact more easily with me. Okay, let's get into syntactic parsing, but please feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have a question um, through chat or um, if you are not too shy, then speak up, please. Okay, so syntactic parsing. So I'll be using the slides from Mohit and I have a few comments about this. So um, may, maybe many of you heard of syntactic parsing, but also be wondering why it's not being covered as an important topic in, um, in, the, in this class. And also maybe you might be um, also observing this topic was not super popular recently, right? So this is because uh, there is a, some history behind this. Um, so syntactic parsing originally was really about understanding the language structure from linguistic point of view. So I think the, the science, linguistics is a science, right? It's science of language. And what the linguistics researchers are interested in is interpreting how human language is structured. And there, the, the goal is basically that. So in that sense, then syntactic parsing is really important because we know that the, the whatever sentence that we um, write or speak has a syntax and that syntax actually induces meaning in the sentence. So this is a science that the, um, this is the, uh, what linguist, linguist, linguists are interested in. So what is the difference between then linguists and for instance, computer scientists who are working in NLP domain? I think the, of course there are, uh, it's, it's more of a, you know, spectrum than um, clear difference, but in the uh, computer science and also AI, what people are really usually interested in is they have some application in their mind um, and yeah, they have some application in mind and um, I'll actually answer a question after the syntactic parsing. So um, they have some application in mind, for instance, question answering is a very specific application, right? So in that case, then they want to achieve these and they're using whatever, whatever tools or models available to achieve this uh, application that has a usefulness in the world. That's more of a, um, I would say AI perspective or NLP perspective. And from the more linguist perspective then um, understanding and really uh, formalizing human language structure is what's really the top priority of linguists. Then what is the uh, syntactic parsing? What was syntactic parsing? So if you actually can do syntactic parsing, that means that you know what the noun is, what the, um, um, for instance, subjective is, you can know all these um, POS tags, part of speech tags. Um, and also you can know what the structure of sentence is, which you will see soon. And uh, NLP researcher thought that these features, I mean, this structure, once they've discovered can be very usefully applied or can be very useful for creating the application that they wanted to create. So that was why syntactic parsing was very popular until I think at least 2017, 2018 um, for feature extraction, basically. And it was actually very powerful too, that um, syntactic parsing was very useful in many applications. But um, deep learning started to take off, right? In 2015, 2014-ish, if you remember uh, how the the machine translation sig to sig model was proposed back then in 2014. They don't have, have any mention about syntactic parsing or using features from syntactic parsing, right? And actually it's not super weird at this point, right? People, everyone thinks that's norm, but then back then 2014, 2015, at least in the NLP community, it was very weird that they didn't use any of those features because people thought those features are really strong and why are not using that? Are you just like um, being too lazy or, um, of course we know now that the answer is 
at the end, if we have enough data, syntactic parsing features will not be uh, adding much, I would say, advantage over the already trained deep neural networks based model. But we did not know that back then in 2014, 2015. So there was a more of a um, transition phase from probably like 2014, 2015 to 2017 and 2018 that there were some work that were using this syntactic parsing results. And, um, and then I think since BERT, we rarely see that because um, basically it seems like most things that syntactic parsing could do are also being done by BERT when they're used as features. So nowadays people just directly optimize for target tasks and utilizing these intermediate structures. But um, as I said, it's still really important research topic in linguistics research. And also um, uh, semantic parsing case, the end goal of the test actually is creating the parse so that it can be executed on database. So it's a bit different in this case that it's still being very actively researched. So back to um, question, back to Sion's question. So question is lower score of perplexity can be signed of being overfitted. Um, if it's low score on the training data, I believe so, yeah. In, if it's on the dev data or test data, then probably not. So I think it's quite uh, similar to um, typical machine learning tasks. But um, the good thing about the, mm, no, no, I mean, never mind. Okay, hopefully that was, um, they gave you an answer, hopefully. Okay, so um, let's go into this slide. So, so I was actually giving you really a long in, in, uh, introduction, but uh, you might be wondering what is syntactic parsing at all. So sorry about that, but you will see really soon. And when I say syntactic parsing, I mean something like, uh, for instance, like this. So if you have a sentence, John met her, then we want to um, give, give each word its role in the part of speech. So for instance, an MP, MP means noun phrase, S means just uh, root, v VP is verb phrase. And um, there are other words that I don't exactly remember at this point actually what these words meant, but basically um, something like transitive verb, which has to have some uh, you know, object and some intransitive verb that doesn't have to have a object and preposition, noun phrase. So these are the um, all different parts of this um, uh, speech, I would say, um, in natural language. And we want to assign these words, I mean, these tags to the words. And also, not only that, so if you wanted to just assign the tag, it'll be this, right? Given John, you want to assign an MP. Given Matt, you want to assign VVD. Given her, you want to assign PRP. That'll be just token classification problem, right? But then you have to do one more thing, which is, you have to actually create a tree of it and which words should go together first. And when I say together, I mean that they are more syntactically related. So, because in English, this met her will be entire verb phrase. That's why it's called VP. It's a bit different uh, depending what the language is though. And we have a noun phrase and we know that noun phrase and verb phrase can create a sentence at the end. So the task is that given, um, given this John met her, we want to map this to this tree structure. That's a task. And now you see why this could have been useful in um, many early day machine learning tasks, because if you could do this successfully, then it is easy to measure distance between words in syntax space. So we know that if, it, if the sentence is really long, it's really hard to know which word some, some word is referring to or very 
um, close to in syntax. And you can just compute the tree distance, right? So that you can know how close they are. Oh, so one thing I wanted to also actually be very sure is that syntactic parsing is a general term referring to any, um, any method that transforms a sentence into this kind of some structure format. So one of a syntactic parsing task is constituent parsing, which transform sentence into these noun phrases and also these verb phrases. And each block is called constituent. So each block is constituent if it can be a subtree of the syntactic parse, this constituent parse. But it is not a constituent if it's not a um, um, subtree. So what 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 with example here? For instance, John Matt will not be a, will not be a constituent because you cannot create a subtree of John Matt but nothing else. But Matt her will be a constituent because this actually corresponds to VP, right? So that's the definition of a constituent. It's very hard to pronounce, by the way. So when you say a, 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 something is a constituent, you can think of it as is a good phrase or not. It's like something that's very self-contained phrase. And it's clear that John Matt is probably not a um, good phrase because Matt is always something that has object. Okay, so we're talking about this specific case of constituent parsing. That's one example of syntactic parsing. And constituent parsing has what's called grammar. So a grammar is a set of rules that each non-terminal node, which is basically all these nodes that are not the actual word from the input can be transformed into. And also, of course, there is a transformation from non-terminals to terminals. Terminals all are the, um, the leaf nodes, basically. So as you see, um, a sentence can be decomposed into noun phrase and verb phrase, but there is also a case that sentence can be decomposed into uh, auxiliary and MP and VP. And also sometimes sentences directly going into verb phrase. So, so they're saying that a sentence, a valid sentence can have different possible structures. And for, um, for each, for each, for each um, phrase or constituent, it can also be transformed into other structures. For instance, um, here, verb, can, verb phrase can be just a single verb. So that will be done something like I walk, right? Then this walk will be just a verb phrase, but it doesn't have any object because it's an intransitive verb. Hopefully you remember this from your, um, high school or middle school English class. Yep, and then, um, or VP can be also verb and noun phrase. In that case, then something like I um, like you and you will be noun phrase and like will be verb. And this is VP. How about VP and MP and PP? So, um, this is uh, one example is that um, I cannot think of example, but you get the point, hopefully, that how this can be transformed into different structures. So this is basically a, a grammar is a, some sort of a, you can think of this as more of a transition rule that you're starting from S and then you're thinking you're, you're defining what's possible way of breaking uh, the sentence into uh, two or more parts and which is called non-terminal non and each non-terminal can be also broken into other non-terminals or they can actually uh, be mapped to one terminal which is uh, the word that we are, we are given in the input stage. Okay. But there's a, a few issues actually with um, constituent parsing. The reason is because the 
the syntax actually depends on the meaning of the sentence. So syntax and semantics are not entirely uh, separable in this case, because look at this sentence. I shot an elephant in my pajamas, right? So here the question is, so who is in pajamas? So is it me or the elephant? So if it's elephant, then we want to have this subtree because elephant in my pajamas. But then if it's me, then we want this in my pajamas to be with I. Right, so it's not clear and um, we can maybe guess because probably I think it's very rare that the elephant will be wearing some pajamas, but um, which is basically borrowing, uh, we're able to infer that because we know what the meaning of the pajamas and elephant and I is. That's actually the area of semantics. Syntax is actually really um, referring to more of a you know, relationship between words, but you get the point that the sentence, we need to actually think about the sentence's meaning to really understand, or I mean, to really infer what its syntax will be in these ambiguous cases. So that's like uh, one of, um, I, I would say difficulty in parsing because no one knows, I mean, at least in this case, it's quite obvious, but in some cases, actually, this ambiguity is uh, much harder and maybe there is no answer to it. So we'll actually see a few examples soon. Um, so we don't have much time today, but so then this is a, we talk about grammar and we'll talk about one particular um, simplification of the grammar which is called context-free grammar. It's called CFG. So it's kind of, I mean, I remember that the CFG was a really important topic when I started my PhD. Um, it was like pre deep learning era. And then I think it's very rare these days because um, it, there are very few papers on this. And also um, back then at least CFG were um, CFG based model could be really useful for a lot of different applications, but um, it's a bit, um, I think it's a bit different world now, but still they are important, I think from the linguistic per, uh, perspective and also maybe you never know, maybe you might, your research might be able to make use of these. So that's why we'll be going through it um, really quickly, but at least once in the class. So a context-free grammar has a four components. So one is the set of non-terminals. So I told you that these non-terminals are uh, sentence, noun phrase, verb phrase, these um, nodes that are not leaves. And T are the set of terminals. And because I told you that terminals are coming from the input words, so it basically this is a vocab you can think of as. And there is a start uh, symbol um, so, but this is not super important, I think, because you will always have star symbol. Like, I mean, that's really not so, not so uh, informative. And there are a set of rules, which is the rule that you just saw in the grammar. So how one non-terminal can transform into other non-terminals or terminals. For instance, S can be NP verb phrase and MP and VP because MP is subject here and VP will be verb with potentially some object or it could be an intransitive verb and VP can be converted into these VP, CC, VP, et cetera. So we want to define these grammars and note that while we are talking about English or uh, natural language, these CFG rules are not really specific to human languages. What I mean by actually is that you will learn this a lot if you are taking programming language class because um, um, I mean, something similar to this because uh, programming language is also language and they are much stricter. Actually, they, are, they have to, it has to be strict. And they basically have, a, uh, in many cases, similar behaviors. Although um, CFG is usually not enough to really create a good programming language. But um, for instance, other, there are other kinds of uh, grammars and more advanced grammars can handle really um, 
really complex programming languages. So um, note that these are not just specific to human languages. And um, I'll probably uh, just mention what PCFG is and then end today's class. We'll come back to this in the next lecture. So we just saw these like uh, transition rules or um, what they call this is uh, rules. Yeah, set of rules. Um, so these rules I show, show you initially that are just um, list of possible transitions, right? But you might be a bit more smart about it by giving some probability that the S will be trans transformed into MP and DP. We can just count that if you have training data, right? So basically prob probabilistic CFG is just inducing that component in the um, CFG. So just uh, giving us some rule instead of just stating that this um, transition can happen. So that means that if once the PCFG is defined, then we can find the most probable parts for a sentence. And that will be the uh, a probable, a very uh, valid task that um, maybe, of course, not tractable, but then still is a valid task that we can work on with a very, very, um, I would say, obvious object, I mean, very clear objective. So we'll, in the next lecture, we'll, be, we'll start with the PCFG and cover the rest of syntactic parsing and go into semantic parsing as well so that we can have um, some more idea what parsing is and how it works. All right, thanks. See you on Monday.